There was a Maharaj, Maharaj is a king, uh, Shantanu. And uh, King Shantanu, it was the family of Kuru uh, and the kingdom of Kuru. Of course, this name is going to be challenging for you a little bit <laughs> because they're Indian names, but try, try to get used to them. And so the king Shantanu uh, one time was um, hunting and he saw a beautiful uh, woman. And this woman is Ganga. Ganga, the goddess of river. So for those of you who know India, there's a, a sacred uh, river, um, Ganga. And that's where they consider this river a sacred river. And so this goddess river, Ganga, was in front of him, and he fell in love with her. And he said, uh, he started to get to know her, and he said, I would love to marry you. And Ganga said, I will marry you, but in one condition, that you will not question me if I do anything that you think is wrong. So no matter what I do, you cannot question me. And so uh, Maharaj King Shantanu agreed. They got married. And on their first year, she got pregnant. She gave the birth to their first son. King hold it, Shantano King hold his son, and he was so happy, and then she took a son from him, went to her river, Ganga, and drowned her first son. King Shantano looked at her and thought, what's going on? Why is she doing that? But he gave a word that he now gonna question Ganga. And so next year, she gave a birth to the second son. He hold his son with happiness and joy. She picked him up, she went back to the river, and she drowned the second son. And she does this seven years in a row. And whole kingdom and Shantanu king feel depressed. Everybody's confused. Everybody's lost. Why? Ganga is killing her seven sons. On the eighth year, she gives birth again to a son. And this time she's again going to the river. But Maharaj Shantanu stops her and tells her, Please don't do this. Why are you doing this? Why are you drowning seven sons and this is the eighth son and you wanted to drown him? And she looked at him and said, we had an agreement. You told me you're not going to question me. And she said, therefore, I am leaving you and I'm taking our son. And she left to her kingdom with gods. Now, for a lot of people who start reading Mahabharata, they think, what's going on? This is bizarre. Why would the mother kill her sons? But now we have to look at what's going on in the kingdom with gods. So in the kingdom with gods, one, we'll call him yogi or a wise man who is praying. He is at the ashram. Ashram is like a church. So he's praying, but he has his favorite cow. Her name is Nandini with her calf. And so Nandini is a special cow. She gives a milk that if you drink a milk, you're going to live forever. And so as the half of God's passing by, one of the half of God's wives says, I want this cow. But they say to, they look at her and there were four, eight of them, half of God's. And they say, do not take it because it's a sin to take from wise men, this cow. She did not listen. She took a cow with the half. And so when Brahman, this wise man, comes out out of his uh, meditation, he looks and he sees how the half of gods, eight of them, took his Nandini, his favorite uh, cow, and he cursed them. And how he curses them means that they will have to be born as a humans. And when they learn that, they're running back to this uh, wise man and they say, Please, can you do anything for us not to be born on, on earth? Because to half of gods, to gods, it's a curse to be born as a humans. Because here we are kind of between um, God and hell, heaven and hell, even though uh, in Ayurveda there's no heaven or hell. Uh, and we suffer here. And so they said, okay, 
this Brahman wise man said, if you really want to go through the curse fast, go to Ganga. And she's planning to be a wife of Shantanu. And ask her to give you birth. And when you will be born, ask her to drown you. So when you die, you'll be back <laughs> with us. And so that's what they did. They went and they said, okay, Ganga said, I'm going to give you birth and I'm going to drown you. So the seven times she was giving, she was drowning her sons. She was drowning the seven uh, half of gods. But on the eighth, she didn't drown because it was her real son whose name was Bhishma. So then was the Shantanu who married Ganga and she gives seven births but then she kills them but on the eighth she gives birth to a very bishma bishma was a famous uh, best warrior wise man who always followed the dharma dharma is trusting god doing everything by a spiritual way and not lying, not stealing, not cheating, not doing anything wrong. He's, he was a very noble. He was one of the best warriors of all times. And so she did not drown the eighth son, who was Brishma. She tells King Shantanu that I'm going to take Brishma with me. And when he's going to be an adult, I'm going to send him back. But first, I'm going to give him all the knowledge. He will become a best soldier, best general, uh, the best wise man. And then I'm going to send him back. So 16, 17 years pass. Shantanu, King Shantanu was very depressed that Ganga left him. But at some point, 15 years later, he meets a beautiful woman, a daughter of a fisherman. And her name is Satya Vati beautiful gorgeous but very proud and do you remember for those of you who've been on the lectures when we were talking about three gunas so people live in the guna of ignorance who are really scared and wish bad things to others and always depressed and unhappy then there's a guna of passion when people want more more beauty, more success, more material things, more awesome things. And then there's a third guna of goodness, where people live to serve God, serve community, and they trust God's will. So this Satya Vatsi is living in a guna of passion. So she meets uh, King Shantanu, and he wants to marry her. And so he proposes to her. They're in the process while they're dating, She's constantly saying how she's good at fishing. She wants more and she's enjoying this beauty. And at some point, uh, King Shantanu meets his son who is back from Ganga in the forest. And he was so happy that his son Bhishma is back. And so he says, wow, we're going to coronize you because you came back and you're the best warrior. You're the best with a wise man. And so he is actually getting ready to make him a king of his kingdom, Kuru. And at the same time, he's asking Satyavati to get married with him. And she says, well, how will I marry you? If I'm going to marry you, you're going to make me like your servant because our kids will never be kings. And he says, you're deeply hurting my heart because you think the success and the money and the crown gonna bring you or our children happiness and with a broken heart he leaves he leaves and at home he is broken hearted for days and weeks and finally his son Bhishma comes to him and says father what's going on with you you are not taking care of our servants all of our kingdom is depressed because you're depressed he's like I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna be okay I'm gonna coronize you gonna make you a king and so he, he leaves and goes to Satyavati and says, what's going on with my father? He's unhappy and miserable. What's happening? And, he, and she says, I don't know what's going on with your father. He said, why are you not getting married? I cannot marry your father because I know that our children are not going to be the rulers. And that means I'm just going to be a servant. And our, my son's going to be servants. 
And he looks at her and says, that means my father is miserable because of me? He says, I will never be king. And he looks at the skies and says, Ganga mother, father of the universe, Krishna and everyone, please hear me. I'm giving my word that I promise I will never get married. I will never have children. And all I'm going to do is protect the kingdom of Kuru. And I'm going to serve you and your children. And he fully sacrifices himself. Then happy, happy Satyavati goes to King Shantanu and says, okay, I'm going to marry you now because your son is, gave up his true kingdom because he was supposed to be the best king to keep Dharma. Dharma, again, is the spiritual way of serving people. Because back then, kings were there not to be rich, but to serve people, servants themselves, and not the other way around. And so she's happy. They got married. Um, they, she gives birth to two sons. The second son is always drunk, always looks for trouble. And he makes enemy here, he makes enemy there. And all he does, he's live in a state, the remember Trigunas, of ignorance. All he's scared and wishing bad things to other people, drinks, scared, and treats people with no respect. Looks at women as if they're trash, and he has no respect for anyone. But all he wants is to become a king. But on the day of the, um, him being a king, his father was supposed to put a crown on his head, and guess what happened? He dies. Because no one is aligned. The gods themselves are not aligned with him being a king. So he dies. And so again, we want to just pay attention here that all these troubles started with what? Her greed. Her greed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The whole Mahabharata starting with this Satyavati's greed that she wanted to be a wife and her sons being a kings, which is not their place. So her son, Vichitravirya dies, but before he dies, his mother, Satyavati, says he needs to get married in order for him to stop drinking and being a good king. And Bhishma, Ganga's son, says, who will marry a drunk person? Nobody wants to marry a drunk person. And she says, well, we're going to send Bhishma, who is the strongest warrior. He can kill 10,000 people by himself to the kingdom with two daughters, Ambika and Ambalika, two beautiful princesses. And so you go there in India back then when they were getting married. Brides would sit and choose from different uh, kings. And they already, one of them already knew who she wanted to marry. And the other two sisters didn't. So there were actually three sisters. And so Bhishma, Ganga's son, goes to Swayambara. Swayambara is the space where they get uh, brides and grooms together to get ready for a wedding. One of the daughters got so angry that he won in the battle with her groom. And Bhishma kills her groom, that she curses him. And she says, I curse you, Bhishma, to die. And so one of the sisters gets angry and leaves and says, I'm going to go to your guru, your teacher, to complain about you that you killed my groom. And he says, you're not supposed to even have a groom. You are right now in the wedding where you have to choose a groom. So one sister leaves, but the other two sisters, Ambalika and Ambika, stays. And so in the battle with other kings, he is winning them and brings those two sisters to the kingdom. To the kingdom, to this drunk son, uh, Vichitra Virya. And so they get married. He's supposed to get crowned, but he dies. And so Satyavati is upset. What's going on? Now we have two brides and no king. And they didn't even have a wedding night. But she looks at the Vedic uh, spiritual knowledge and says, we can go to a priest and a priest will have only one night 
with these two brides. And then this is going to be the kings of our kingdom. And that's the rule. It's, it's okay. But when the priest goes to sleep with Ambika, he doesn't want to do it. He closes his eyes. And so Ambika gives the birth to a son who is blind. Then he makes love to another daughter who is Ambalika. And um, everything go went well there. And he gives sons to a son, Pandu, who is a really noble, good, wise, and kind man. But he also makes love to a mate. And there, there's the third son. And so after nine months, three boys are born. And Satya Vatsi says, I'm going to accept only two boys. The blind one, whose name is Tritarashtra. I know the names are difficult. <laughs> Who is blind. And the second son from Ambalika Pandu. And later, this is going to be battle. Dhritarashtra's wife will give birth to a hundred sons, and Pandu will give birth to five sons. Can you see? Can you see? A uh, hundred sons from Dhritarashtra. hundred. And uh, from Pandu, it's five sons. So it's going to be very strange. She's not going to have a normal birth where she's going to give birth through nine months. It's going to be very strange. Uh, experience a but question. yes is she a human or is she then a god or is she human Doesn't yeah yeah, yeah. it's all humans all human yeah. all human but how she's gonna give birth it's gonna uh -huh. be very much outside of the box <laughs> it's gonna be different she'll be even pregnant for two years but we'll get to it next time and the maid gives a birth to a third son i mean one son and he becomes, Bhishma says to Satyavati, even though he is the son from a maid, he's still going to be the ruler. And his position, because every time priest picks up the son, says, this one's going to be a good warrior. Dhritarashtra was blind, but he will be a good warrior. But deep in his heart, Brahman, that he will be very greedy, very confused, very uncertain, very fearful, not sure of himself. Pandu, they said he'll be very kind, very noble, very wise, and a good warrior. Uh, and therefore, we're calling him Pandu. And the third, third boy, Bhishma says, he also going to be ruled. He will be very wise, and he will be consulting both brothers. And so, Dhritarashtra and Pandu is raised, and also the third son is raised by Bhishma, who is teaching them the war, how to be a soldiers, how to know the archery. He's teaching them how to live by Dharma. But the blind son, who is going to be the future king, is always thinking about how he's going to get the crown, how he's going to sit on the throne, how he's going to rule, how he's going to be the best of the best but always scared and uncertain, scared and fearful and uncertain. So obviously, if we're looking at the Trigunas, he's living in a state of ignorance. And that's what I would like for you to start to connect to it. Are you living in a state of ignorance? Are you living in a state of passion? Are you living in a state of goodness? Because every time in our life, we're going from one to second, from second to third. But our goal is to obviously live in a state of goodness, surrendering and trusting God. And so Tatya Vati, with whom it all started, the daughter of a fisherman, is hoping now, okay, he's not supposed to be a king if he's blind, but if we're going to find him a bride who obviously is beautiful, who you can see, she can rule and help him to rule through her eyes. And they found out there's a beautiful bride in a kingdom, Gandhari. So we also heard that she's supposed to have 100 sons. So she's sending Bhishma to the kingdom or of Gandhara to get Gandhari, Princess Gandhari, to marry a blind son. Because nobody would want to marry a blind man. So they're sending again Bhishma. Bhishma, the strong warrior. So he takes all of the uh, soldiers, I don't know, 100,000 or something, and they go to a kingdom of Gandhar. And Gandhar, King Gandhar looks at it, why are we having Bhishma ready to attack them with so much army? 
And Bhishma is, uh, with white flag says, no, we just want to come and talk to you. They talk and they said, we want to take your daughter to our son for a wedding. And they say, wow, we're so excited. You want to get Gandhari marrying to your son Pandu, the second good son. And they said, okay. But then Bhishma says, no, she's not going to marry the second son. She's going to marry a first son who is blind. So now King Ganhar and his wife is very sad and they don't know how to say to Ganhari, their daughter. And their daughter, Ganhari, is very scared of dark. Every night she wakes up because she's scared of a dark. And she puts hundreds of candles because she's afraid what if the can one candle go away, the, uh, she, will, <laughs> she will be fully surrounded by darkness. So all of her servants constantly putting the candles so she will not be scared to sleep. And eventually she finds out that she is now engaged to a blind uh, king, Dhritarashtra. And she is upset and confused why her father and her mother decided to give her away to a blind man, but then she surrenders and she says, I understand. I understand that this is my destiny. But her brother, Shakuni, who is in love with his sister, loves her dearly. He went to hunting to uh, get those little insects that um, put the lights at night. I don't Fireflies. know. Fireflies. Mm -hmm. He loves his sister so dearly. He comes home, finds out that his sister is about to get married to a blind Dhritarashtra with a terrible personality who is angry and is in a state of ignorance. He's furious. He says, okay, okay, father, I will go, but I will leave with my sister in that king kingdom in order to protect her. So with that said, it's 12 o'clock. We're going to finish. We're going to continue the story of Mahabharata next time. Uh, but I wanted to ask you questions. Is it so far clear you're starting to uh, understand a little bit of concepts of where the Vedic knowledge is coming from? Mm -hmm. Because later Krishna is going to come and he's going to take the side of Pandu and there will be clear division between evil and good the family Pandu with five brothers. But in the meantime, I wanted to ask you, what are you getting? And is there any questions or unclarity in what I'm sharing? I get it. The only thing that keeps coming to my mind is with Bhishma, like... Bhishma, uh-huh. Why is he killing these people for the queen? Uh-huh. That feels like bad dharma. Mm, very good. The reason why Bhishma is killing is because he gave a word that he will protect who? The queen. The queen Kuru family. And um, in the Vedic spiritual knowledge, if a mother, to him she is a mother, second mother even though he has Ganga, but he gave a word, I will protect you no matter what, and she's violating this word. But he's not. He's following the Dharma. And that's why Krishna also going to come and will question is he doing everything right? Because he's so committed to his word, because he said, I'm going to protect, even though it's not good for the kingdom. But she says, you forgot, you gave me the word to protect me and our kingdom. And therefore, she constantly violates because she lives in a state of passion. And even though he wants to follow Dharma, and he does, but she's in a state of passion. And do you see how there is a violation between one and two? Yeah, because she is not following Dharma. Mm -hmm. She just cares to get um, her son or her grandson to the crown. That's her main goal. Mm -hmm. She only thinks about that. And that's where there's a conflict. I have a question. Yes. Then for Shantanu, then he's just kind of letting her do whatever. Uh, because I think oh, by the way, Shantanu died. Gotcha. Sorry uh, for not saying that. Uh, Satyavati okay. is ruling and yeah. Bhishma is helping you because Shantanu died uh, after he married Satyavati. Gotcha. So please forgive me. Okay. Shantanu I'm died. Like, why is he not speaking up? I know, I know. <laughs> please forgive me. I forgot to okay. mention that Shantanu very shortly died. So she is ruling 
uh, Satyavati and Bhishma is her right hand is helping her. Gotcha. Yeah. And they're also cons uh, consulting with the third son. If you remember, not the blind, not the pondered, but the third from the maid, maid son. I forgot um, uh, his name starts with V. Uh, we, nah, sorry, forgot. <laughs> yeah, and, and so she is gonna go through so much pain because she took Bhishma's title, real position. He was supposed to be king, and now everything gonna go through more and more trouble because of her living in a state of passion. And I want you to start getting connected how sometimes one action. One action in life that we're doing wrong because we're driven by either ignorance or passion, meaning greed, because I want more, takes our full life in a completely different uh, direction and everything starts to go more and more and more difficult and challenging. And that's what really the core of this book, how there's constant battle. Now, going back to the yogi meditation, um, yogi... We're going to stop with Mahabharata. I just want to close it off to share that in yogi, in in United States and in Europe, we know yogi by kind of like Pilates, Zumba, yogi. But the true yogi has eight distinctions. And we actually right now go through meditation in depth. We're going to later go in yogi asanas, which is third in depth. But more important in yogi is yami niyami which is after the 10 sessions of the meditation, how to do it correctly. We're going to start learning the true principles of yogi. Yami Niyami, for example, the first uh, principle is not to harm anyone and not live in a state of fear. Mm -hmm. Don't write it down. We're going to go in depth. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so there's so many different principles that nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Because when you really do yami niyami, then the third yogi, which is asanas, becomes very simple. But that's what our true mind is. Nobody's teaching that in the Western society. And that's the core of yogi. And that's why I'm also sharing the Vedic knowledge to prepare you a little bit for yami niyami the principles. And then there's more. There's eight principles that yogis follows.